NASA has postponed the Artemis 1 mission launch for September 3 following a recent setback. The Space Launch System rocket was supposed to lift off from Kennedy Space Center on August 29. But after running into several issues, NASA called off the attempt. The first problem on Monday, a hydrogen leak near the rocket's tail service mast umbilical, came during the core stage fueling process. The leak resembled one that happened during the wet dress rehearsal testing in April and July. The leak was later fixed by properly chilling all related systems, and propellant loading was eventually completed. The second problem was a crack that formed on the SLS core stage's intertank flange, which connects the rocket's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tanks. NASA engineers discovered that the crack was actually in the flange's insulating foam, not in the rocket's metal structure. There was a line of ice that had formed on the inner tank, on the exterior of the core stage, where there is a flange. Engineers have uh, taken a long look at that and have come up with a conclusion that ice that formed is essentially air that's being chilled by the tank that gets trapped inside of a crack in the foam, but not the actual tank. Essentially, to the untrained eye, it can look like a crack, but what it actually is, according to the engineers, is air is being sucked in, chilled, and then comes right back out of that foam as vapor. And it appears like it looks like something is leaking when, in fact, it's not. The real showstopper of the day occurred when NASA attempted to chill the core stage's four RS-25 engines. To get the engines to the proper temperatures needed to handle its super-cold propellant during ignition, NASA engineers bleed some of the liquid hydrogen to the engines. On Monday, one of the four engines had issues reaching the appropriate levels during the bleed test. Engineers asked for additional time to work on the issue, leading to the countdown entering an unplanned hold at T-minus 40 minutes. After more than an hour of failed attempts to chill engine number three, NASA officially canceled the launch attempt. Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub of the attempt of launch of Artemis 1 and the space launch system with the Orion spacecraft. According to the agency, most likely the problem could be with the temperature sensor in the engine rather than the flow of liquid hydrogen into the engine. On Tuesday, August 30th, NASA announced that they're moving ahead with a second launch attempt during a two-hour window that begins at 6.17 p.m. UTC on September 3rd. Reviewed the data from Monday's launch attempt and uh, we, here's what we agreed on. Uh, we agreed uh, on what was called option one, which was to operationally change the loading procedure uh, and start our engine chill down earlier. Uh, we also agreed to do some work at the pad uh, to address the, uh, the leak that we saw at the hydrogen tail service mast umbilical. And we also agreed to move our launch date to Saturday, September the 3rd. Even if technical problems are resolved, the weather could be a concern for a launch on Saturday. Weather officers say the probability of violating weather constraints is somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% for that day. The probability for a backup launch opportunity on Monday, September 5th, is slightly better, with a 70% chance of acceptable weather for launch. But NASA is optimistic that the weather will clear during the launch window on Saturday, giving Artemis 1 a chance to lift off. NASA has awarded five additional missions to SpaceX for crew transportation services to the International Space Station as part of the agency's commercial crew transportation capability contract. The contract, worth $1.4 billion, modifies the existing commercial crew contract that NASA initially awarded to SpaceX in 2014. According to the revised contract, SpaceX will now cover missions from Crew 10 through Crew 14, representing approximately 20 spacecraft seats overall. SpaceX's Crew-5 mission is expected to launch in early October, and Crew-4 is at the space station right now. NASA has previously awarded Boeing six missions to fly astronauts to the space station under the commercial crew program, however, the company has yet to launch a crewed Starliner mission. NASA and Boeing are planning to launch the first piloted test flight of the Starliner in February. According to NASA, the newly awarded contract to SpaceX will allow the agency to maintain an uninterrupted U.S. capability for human access to the space station until 2030. After recently breaking its own annual launch record, SpaceX is now aiming at a milestone never reached before. In his recent tweet, Elon Musk revealed that SpaceX would aim for 100 orbital launches next year, making it the world's first company to do so. SpaceX has launched 39 orbital missions so far in 2022, almost one every 6.2 days. The ever-growing tally has surpassed the company's previous record of 31 liftoffs in a year, achieved in 2021. Many of next year's SpaceX launches will be large batches of Starlink satellites. In addition, the company intends to launch multiple Starship missions next year.
The Federal Communications Commission's decision to allow SpaceX to place more satellites at lower altitudes was upheld by an appeals court in the United States. In 2021, SpaceX received FCC approval to deploy 2,824 satellites into a 550 km altitude, where it already operates over 1,000 spacecraft. According to SpaceX, flying Starlink satellites at a lower altitude would boost internet service to remote areas. Competitors via SAT Inc. and Dish Network Corporation contested the FCC's decision and argued that the agency should have carried out a complete environmental study of SpaceX's constellation before letting it operate more satellites at lower altitudes. While via SAT worries that Starlink satellites could collide with others and cause debris, the court said this theory of injury is much too speculative. Viasat have also argued that SpaceX's constellation makes it more expensive and technically challenging for Viasat to launch its own satellites. The court ruled that these and other harms mentioned by Viasat are economic in nature and do not fall under the purview of the National Environmental Policy Act's protection of interests. Dish Network had argued that SpaceX's altitude change would interfere with the broadcaster's satellites. The court said that FCC had taken the likelihood of interference into account and found that a change in the altitude of Starlink satellites will not increase interference to satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, the Royal Caribbean Group announced that it would use Starlink service to provide internet connectivity to passengers and crew on board its cruise ships. The company began with a trial on board the cruise ship Freedom of the Seas, which has already received positive feedback from both crew members and guests. The Royal Caribbean Group hopes to have Starlink installed on 50 ships by the end of March 2023. Future ships using these brands will be linked to Starlink as well. This announcement comes almost two months after SpaceX announced Starlink Maritime, which provides a seagoing vessels with up to 350 megabits per second download speed. The cost of Starlink Maritime includes a one-time hardware cost of $10,000 and a monthly payment of $5,000. Please check out the link in the description to learn more about SpaceX's Starlink Maritime service. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX has lit up multiple engines on Super Heavy Booster 7 for the first time ever. Last month, SpaceX performed two successful static fires with Booster 7 on the orbital launch mount. Both of those tests involved just one of the vehicle's Raptor engines. On August 31st, at 1.03 p.m. local time, SpaceX upped the scale of the test by lighting up multiple Raptors on the prototype for about five seconds. According to Ted Malaska, senior director of application software at SpaceX, Wednesday's test was a dual-engine static fire test. However, slow-motion video of the test fire reveals that only two engines may have fully ignited, with the third possibly aborting seconds after ignition. Whether or not the third Raptor participated in the test, it was still the first multi-engine super heavy static fire that SpaceX has performed. On Friday morning SpaceX teams removed an inner Raptor engine labeled RC-76 from Booster 7. This could be the Raptor that failed to ignite during the static fire test. We are yet to receive official confirmation from SpaceX or Elon Musk. Hours later, a new engine, labeled RC-29, was installed into the booster. The Booster 7 static fire testing will almost certainly continue, with SpaceX firing more and more engines in the coming days. Elon Musk recently gave a huge update regarding the Starship orbital launch mount. You may remember my previous video on the Raptor quick disconnect mechanism. In that video, I highlighted how SpaceX uses 20 quick disconnect mechanisms to spin-start the outer 20 engines of the booster and composite overwrapped pressure vessels filled with high-pressure helium to spin-start the inner 13 engines. Since COPVs are installed on the booster, the vehicle has to carry the weight of those pressure vessels throughout its journey, limiting the maximum velocity that can be achieved. Now, in an August 28 tweet, Musk revealed that the launch mount and Raptor engine plumbing have recently been upgraded to externally supply the helium required to spin start all 33 booster engines during liftoff. This would eliminate the need to install high pressure COPVs in the booster, thus lowering the total mass of the booster. Still, the booster must carry enough helium to spin-start the engines during the boost back, re-entry, and landing burns. However, the booster will only ignite two or three of the 13 internal engines for these purposes. So, compared to the earlier scenario, where it had to carry enough helium-filled COPVs for liftoff, boost back, re-entry, and landing burns, in this revised scenario, the booster would only have to carry less helium and fewer COPVs. This will significantly reduce the overall mass of the booster. In a separate tweet, Musk mentions that the Starship full stack will grow by at least 5 to 10 meters over time. This implies that in the near future, the height of the Starship or Super Heavy, or both will be raised. 
SpaceX already has plans for a taller depot Starship which will be used for the on-orbit refilling of lunar Starships. Last week, SpaceX had Starship 24 hooked up to a crane for several days. This has left Starship fans confused as to whether SpaceX is planning to remove the ship from Pad B for full stack or whether they are planning to roll back the ship to the production site. But in reality, the crane was used to secure and stabilize the ship, while SpaceX teams were working inside the liquid oxygen tank section to fix some issues. The crane was unhooked from the ship after the work. SpaceX tried to conduct a Ship 24 static fire test on Wednesday, but the plan was aborted after filling the propellant tanks of the ship with cryogenic liquid methane and liquid oxygen. On Friday afternoon, a Raptor vacuum engine was removed from Ship 24 and taken back to the build site. The engine was later moved into a production tent at the build site. It's currently unclear why SpaceX removed an engine from Ship 24. Ship 24's tests might resume next week. Teams have also upgraded Pad B lately, adding heat and blast-resistant concrete and flame diverters under the pad. The flame diverters will protect the Starship and Pad B structures from the intense heat during static fire tests. SpaceX conducted structural tests of Booster 7.1 test tank on September 1. The test tank, which has passed three such structural stress tests in the past, was delivered to the launch site on August 25. On August 29, the tank was installed on top of the can crusher test stand. Hours later, the cap of the test stand was lifted with the help of a crane and placed atop the booster test tank. During Thursday's structural test, the test tank was initially filled with cryogenic liquid nitrogen and then 20 cables running from the cap of the can crusher to the hydraulic rams of the test stand began to squeeze it. The test, which lasted for about eight hours, was carried out to test the latest super heavy design changes by simulating the forces that the vehicle will experience during flight. At the build site, teams have recently placed the nose cone section of Ship 25 on top of the forward dome section. Thermal protection tile installation over the nose cone is nearly complete. Ship 25 will be fully stacked and ready for ground tests shortly. Teams have also begun installing aerodynamic surfaces known as chines on Super Heavy Booster 8. On Tuesday night, at Kennedy Space Center, teams rolled out the eighth section of the Starship Orbital Launch Tower from SpaceX's operations area at Roberts Road to launch Complex 39A. SpaceX is currently extending a crane to stack the eighth section atop the seventh section. The ninth and final section of the tower is currently being prefabricated at Roberts Road. The 146-meter-tall Starship Launch Tower will be completed once this section is finished stacking in the coming days. A lot of work is still needed to make the tower fully functional like the one at Starbase. This includes completing the tower's internal plumbing and support structures, installing the rocket catching and stacking arms, and the Starship Quick Disconnect Mechanism. Construction of the tower arms and Quick Disconnect Mechanism is underway at Roberts Road. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.